think of Paul and Silas sitting in a jail cell, and uh, they decided to just sing and praise the Lord and pray. And uh, the old preacher John Jasper said that uh, Paul and Silas were sitting in that jail cell singing, and God got so excited to see his servants praising him in the midst of difficulty that he joined in on the bass note. And uh, there was an earthquake and shook the whole jail and the doors came open and they could go free. And uh, that might not be exactly what happened. I appreciate Brother Jasper's imagination on that. Uh, but God does want to hear us sing through all the circumstances of life. I'm going to ask you to turn this morning to 1 Samuel chapter 17, please. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And... Uh, good portion of the message this morning is going to be reading a narrative here from the scriptures. And so if you happen to not have a Bible with you, if you'll look under the seats in front of you there, there should be some Bibles located there. And some of them should even be large print. And uh, that'll be a help to some uh, more than others. If you don't need large print, the person beside you does, just switch with them, all right? Uh, but uh, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 17, and, and I want you to see what God has to say here this morning. <clears throat> 1 Samuel 17, verse number 1 says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at uh, Shaco, uh, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah, in Ephadamon, I looked these words up, so y'all bear with me here. There's just one key thing that you need to understand here. The Philistines, um, they lived in an area along the coast of the Mediterranean in the southern part of Israel that uh, is now known, of, known as Gaza. I don't know if you ever heard of that before, uh, but th that's where they lived. And they were a very uh, violent people. They were uh, very militant. And they were, it seems like through a portion of Israel's history, they were constantly trying to drive up into the land that belonged to Israel and uh, conquer and plunder and, and those sort of things. So notice in verse 1, kind of a key component here, that the Philistines gathered together and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah. Now, here's why that's important. They've invaded. So they, are, they have moved into territory that doesn't belong to them. It belonged it belong to Judah. And so now the, the army of Judah, the armies of Israel, have to respond to that. Because we've, we've got a problem. We've got an invasion. We've got, a, we've got a difficulty here. Verse number two. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. So what happens in that verse? And don't worry, I'm not going to stop and explain what happens in every verse of this chapter. But what happens in that verse is that Saul and his armies go and to set the battle in array means to organize themselves in a position against the opposing army. So we're going to get details about that in verse 3. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Six cubits and a span uh, roughly amounts to nine and a half feet tall. Nine and a half feet tall. So if you think of a regulation basketball goal height, that's ten foot. So he just lacks inches from hitting his head on a basketball rim. Now, that's a giant. But I got to tell you, I grew up having been read to me Jack and the Beanstalk. And when I found out that Goliath was only nine and a half feet tall, I thought, that's not as giant as I imagined. You know, when you're thinking, when you're thinking the animated Mickey Mouse and uh, the Beanstalk, 
uh, and that giant, you know, and then you're reading these Bible stories, you're like, man, just, just this gargantuan fellow. No, he was nine and a half feet tall. That's a huge guy. It's a huge guy. And, and you say, well, yeah, but he's nine and a half feet tall, but he probably weighed 100 pounds soaking wet or something like that. No, no. Uh, a, a guy without some bulk and mass to go with that height could not have supported the armor he wore or carried the weaponry that he had. Watch what it says here. In verse number five, he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and as if that wasn't enough, one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. And if he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. So this giant comes out there on, on his side of the valley, on the mountain, and he yells across the valley to where the armies of, of Israel are set in array. They're, they're set in opposition and in a fighting position to defend their land. He comes out and he says... We don't need armies to settle this. Let's just do this by champions. So you pick your guy and come out against me and we'll fight one-on-one -on -one and, and whoever wins, then the other people will be servants to the winner. That sound like a deal? Now, that's a, that, in, in a lot of circumstances, that might seem like a simplified way of settling the situation, except the little Jewish people over here are looking across the valley to the other mountain and they see a guy nine and a half foot tall and this is the guy that one man has to beat in order to, to free from uh, the, the tyranny and the terrorism all of the people of Israel. So that's a lot on anybody's shoulders. That's, that's a considerable weight on anybody. So the Bible says in verse 10, And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. So he's taunting them. He's reproaching them. Uh, he's uh, mocking them. And he says, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard the, those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed. And greatly afraid. The word dismayed means they broke down. That's what, that's what the word means. So when they heard the words of the Philistine, they broke down. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. And then enter another character into the story. Verse number 12. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse... And he had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah, and David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And I'm not going to go into the details of that, but David had already known Saul, been acquainted with Saul, and now at this time of war, young David had returned from Saul back to keep his father's sheep um, in Bethlehem. Verse 16, And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself forty days. 
So we're just shy of six weeks that the one army is on one side of the valley, the other army is on the other side of the valley, and for 40 days, uh, this Philistine, twice a day at least, morning and evening, comes out, defies the armies of Israel, asks for them to send out a man for him to fight, and uh, there's not a lot of motion going on. There's not a lot of activity going on uh, in this situation. Verse number 17. And Jesse said unto David, his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. Now this is when things change right here. And David heard him. So David hears the same words that everybody else had heard, but David, David thinks differently about the words he heard than everybody else did. All right, so verse number 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. Would you mind to look up here for a second, just a second? Not a bad prize. I mean, I don't know what the daughter looked like, but not a bad prize. I, I, great riches, a daughter to be his wife, and, uh, and freedom for your entire household uh, in all of Israel. Now, this statement alone is telling because it wasn't all that long ago when the people of Israel were free, but they wanted a king. Anybody remember this? And you can go back and read about this. They wanted a king. And God told Samuel, I want you to go and solemnly protest about the kind of king they want. Tell them the truth of what it's going to be like if they get the king that they want. And Samuel went and told him, he said, look, you want a king and God's going to give you one, but he's going to give you the king that you want, but you're not going to like it because he's going to take your sons, he's going to take your daughters, He's going he's gonna to basically put you in bondage to, his, to himself. And so now, sure enough, we're just chapters later, and King Saul is offering freedom for the household of anybody that goes and kills this uh, champion Philistine or Philistine. I might pronounce that differently throughout the course of the message. Bear with me. Both pronunciations are accurate, but I need to choose one and stick with it probably. So, so here we are, this promise has been made by Saul to anyone who kills the champion. Verse 26, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? Now, it's easy to read that and go, Why is David asking that question? They just told him what happens to the man who kills the Philistine. They, they, they just told that. But understand, David's asking a different question. Saul said, any, Saul, Saul told the men, and the men have now told David, anybody that kills the Philistine, 
Well, they're going to get great riches. They're going to get the, the king's daughter. And they're going to, they're going to get uh, the uh, household freedom in Israel. David says, I got a question for you, fellas. What do you think God's going to do for the man who goes out and delivers Israel from this reproach? In other words, he's not looking at this with earthly eyes, so to speak. He doesn't look at the man as, a, as the big problem. He sees a bigger problem, and the problem is the name of God is being blasphemed. That God is not getting the glory out of his people that he deserves. That God is being made to look like a weakling. And so David says, I see a bigger problem here that's worth more of a reward than just riches and a daughter and freedom from the king. But what is going to happen to the man that taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? There's something in David's thinking that doesn't appear to be in the thinking of the rest of Israel at this point. And that's God himself. But David's thinking about God. David's thinking about God's name. David's thinking about how God looks in this situation. And whether or not God is being trusted or relied upon. That matters to David. So verse 27, the people answered him after this manner saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. In other words, so David asks a different question. And the guys give him the same answer. It's like, David, we, we just told you what would be done to the man. He gets riches. He gets the king's daughter. He gets freedom for his household in Israel. We just told you this. So they don't, they don't, they're not even cluing in here. Verse 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men... And Eliab's anger was killed, uh, kindled, I'm sorry, against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause in other words, the reason that I'm saying anything at all is because there's a reason to say something. There's a reason for Israel to prevail in this situation. There is a cause. Verse 30, And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. So if you're, if you're imagining this, David's talking with soldiers in the army. And it appears that this conversation is going on back at the camp right after all of the army of Israel has ran away from the giant. And David is saying, what did I just see here? What, what did I just witness here? And so they say, well, did you not see that, that champion that came out? Surely this guy has come to defy Israel. And, uh, but the king has said, anybody that kills him, Gave the reward. David says, wait a minute. God's name ought to enter into this. And they said, yeah, well, the king's going to give this reward to whoever. And then Eliab shows up and says, uh, is just completely presumptuous about David's attitude and David's words and David's actions and judges him based on presumption and uh, kind of rebukes him. And David doesn't... <laughs> David doesn't flinch. He just turns to some other men. After saying to Eliab, is there not a cause? David turns to some other men and says, is there not a cause? And asks them the same question. He answered after the same manner. He asked the same question. Now he's asking different people. I'm asking, is there not a cause, men? Is there not a cause here? Watch what happens here. So the Bible says, And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. They said, Oh, well, yeah, there is a cause to go defeat Goliath. Um, the cause is 
You could have great riches. You could marry his daughter. You could have household freedom in Israel. Have you ever been around people that just get stuck? <laughs> These people are just stuck. They're stuck on uh, looking at, at earthly rewards, earthly b dividends and benefits, which in some cases will never be enough to get you over the hump to face something you really don't want to face. David's got something in his mind greater than that, though. So the Bible says in verse 31, and when the words of David were, and when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Okay. That's interesting. No, some of you missed that. I gotta go back over this. He's watching sheep. They're out there in the pasture field grazing. He's up on a little high rocky outcropping, and he he's got his staff in his hand, and he's just looking out over the sheep. And he notices he notices a little commotion over here, and he realizes, oh my goodness, there's a lion. I don't know if he saw him crouching in the grass or in full pursuit of one of the lambs or whatever, but he got to that lamb and he caught him in his mouth and David goes after the lion and delivers the lamb out of his mouth and so the lion then turns on David. I, I don't know if anybody's ever watched any uh, uh, like animal nature shows on this kind of stuff. But lions get very protective of their prey. So David, David takes the lamb from him and he turns on David. So David grabs him by his beard. Are y'all getting this? And smote him and slew him. Now anybody that reads this story... And I'm a literalist. I don't believe... No, David wrote some poetic literature. I don't believe this is poetic. I believe that happened. I believe David was telling the truth. Because we can't look and go, man, David is... He's the man. Because David would tell you, the only reason I was able to do that is because God helped. God delivered that, that lamb back to me. God delivered that lion, and, and, and God delivered that bear to me. So, so David gave all of the glory for God's help, uh, to God for God's help, and, and yet we have to read that story and go, that's impressive. I'm fascinated by lions. I have never grabbed one by the mane. And I'm not even talking about in like a, a friendly petting zoo somewhere or something like that. But much less one who had turned on me, squared off, and said, you look more tasty than that lamb anyway. And David grabbed that thing by the beard and smote it and slew it. That's impressive. That's impressive. Verse number 36, Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, I killed the lion and the bear just protecting what I was responsible for, but this Philistine is defying God. 
So if God delivered the lion and the bear into my hands when I was just trying to be responsible, then how much more is God going to deliver this guy into my hands if his name is at stake here? So David just points that out. Verse number uh, 37. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. It's finally good to hear somebody else talking about the Lord in this situation. But Saul said, go, and the Lord be with thee. Verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go. He attempted, that's what that word means, he tried to go, for he had not proved it. So he tried, but didn't, because he said, I, I haven't tested this. I haven't proved this. I, I don't know this method. I like how Saul says, the Lord go with thee, and here's all my armor. <laughs> it doesn't seem like Saul has a lot of confidence in the Lord, does he? Saul says, Saul says hey, the Lord be with thee, but just in case, let me, let me put every piece of metal on you we have around here. And maybe you'll have a better shot. But David said, I, I can't go like this. I haven't tested any of this. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. In other words, he, he didn't give him a second thought. He, he didn't give him any respect at all. He disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. He's just a baby face kid out here. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. If you wanted to know what David's cause was, there it is right there. That other people looking on to that situation would know that God is real and God is able. And that when you trust him and you obey him and you do things his way, it really works. So David just laid it out there. You say, man, that's some kind of trash talking he did. Well, I don't know about anywhere else, but in the basketball world, it's only trash talk if you can back it up. And uh, maybe I should say it's not trash talk. Uh, he's making a claim here. But you know what? Goliath made claims too. I'm going to feed you to the fowls of the air. David essentially said, I'm going to feed you to the fowls of the air. But I'm going to do it in God's name. I'm going to do it because God matters. I'm going to do it because, because there is a God in Israel. 
So verse number 47, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. So David's not even going to sit back and wait. David goes in full charge mode. All right? He, he, he's headed that way. And verse 49, And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it. And by the way, to my recollection, my understanding, this is the first guided missile in the Bible. The Bible says that he took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So if you go back a little bit and you remember that picture of the armor and everything, so he's got a helmet, he's got uh, greaves on his legs, he's got a target of brass, I mean, he's got a shield bearer in front of him. He's covered just about everywhere except right between his eyes. And David takes a stone, and let me remind you this, he didn't pull an arrowhead out of the creek. He got a smooth stone. You know, it was almost like care was taken to make a point here that he had no tactical advantage in this situation, that if this was going to be accomplished, it was going to be accomplished because God did something that man can't do. That's what it was. So he hurls this smooth stone in Goliath's direction, and it finds that unprotected mark and sinks into the forehead, and Goliath fell on his face to the earth. Verse 50, So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. He had just made a point of that, that he didn't come with swords, that, that God wasn't going to win the victory with because, because the army had swords. So he didn't have a sword in his hand. Verse 51, Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof. If you're squeamish, bear with me for a second. And slew him and cut off his head therewith with his own sword. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Y'all remember the agreement, right? Y'all remember the agreement Goliath said? He said, hey, if you defeat me, then we'll serve you. But if, if I defeat you, then you serve us. So now David has removed the head of the champion and the armies of the Philistines said, okay, a deal's a deal, fellas. We're your servants. No. They did not honor the deal. They fled. They ran away. They tried to get back to Gath and Ekron and get in their cities and, and that sort of thing. I mean, they headed for the hills. And so the Bible says they fled. Verse 52, And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sharaim even unto Gath and unto Ekron, the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines and they spoiled their tents and David took the head of the Philistines and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent and when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. I don't know where this kid came from. And the king said, Inquire thou whose, the, whose son the stripling is. 
And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. That's a story that's told again and again and again. I mean, that's a prime Sunday school story. That's been illustrated in Bible books so often. Usually they leave out the part about cutting the head off in the children's books. But um, David didn't want any room for error. And I'd say cutting off the head means he's done. I'm not trying to be crass, but I'm trying to say this. David had a point to make. David had a cause to accomplish. And David's cause was not great riches. David's cause was not to marry the king's daughter. David's cause was not even freedom of his household in Israel. David's cause was we are servants of God who claim his name. And what is our circumstance demonstrating about our God right now? In the current way that this is going for the past 40 days, our God doesn't look to be real. Our God doesn't look to have any power. Our God doesn't look to be turning the tide or changing anything in this circumstance. And they're just sitting there at a stalemate. Sometimes they're just setting the battles in array. Sometimes it seems like the, there's references to fighting. And so there very well might have been skirmishes between the armies. But they're not, they're not really accomplishing anything. But, but here's what we know from the story. Here's what we know from the story. That, that had the armies of Israel not gone out and set themselves on the other side of the Valley of Elah, do you think the Philistines would have stayed where they were or just kept coming on in? No, in order to stop the incoming invasion, the army had to be faced. So Saul took his men out there and they set themselves in array to basically say, look, we, we know this is not a good situation. We know something's going to have to be done about that. But it seems like for about six weeks, that's the way the situation stayed. If, if Israel withdraws, they're just giving up ground to the enemy. But they, they don't feel like they can advance because the Philistines have this nine and a half foot tall guy and there's a rumor that he's got brothers and there's kind of a whole, seems like you read the rest of the Bible, there's kind of a whole family over there of these giants and we don't know when they're going to show up. This is, a, this is just a bad deal. God's people historically were always scared of giants. You might remember that going all the way back to uh, Joshua and, and Moses in, in Moses' day. There's giants in the land over there and, and they're scared of giants. But here's a young man who has more desire for God's greatness to be displayed, then he has fear over the giant that's creating all the problems. Now, I didn't go through all that to tell us the Bible story today. The truth is, regularly in our Christian lives, I'm talking about where we live today we are called upon to be like David again and again and again. And what I mean by that is it's different in our circumstance than it was in David's. David had to go fight a big nine and a half foot tall guy. But what our instruction is in Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle or fight not against flesh and blood. As Christians, our battle, our giant is never going to be a nine and a half foot tall guy that, that we have to wrestle against. We're not fighting people. 
But this story is included in God's Word to give us an understanding that there are things worth taking a stand for and fighting for, even though our fighting is not with weaponry. As a matter of fact, Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We're, we're, we're not going out here fighting battles with earthly weapons, with swords, with spears, and things like that. No, no, no. But that doesn't mean that we don't face giants who invade our life and try to take spiritual ground from us that God wants us to hold on to. I'm saying the battles that we face are spiritual battles. The problems that we're facing are, are, are spiritual warfare. We're fighting against our flesh. We're fighting against attitudes. I'm talking about bad attitudes and negative attitudes. We're, we're fighting against things like bitterness. We're fighting against consequences of bad decisions. We're, we've got, we can have massive giants that all of a sudden we look and they've invaded our land and look to do nothing is to let them have complete control. But I believe here's what happens a lot of times. We recognize that that giant should be there, and we kind of put up a front against him. We recognize that that's an enemy, and we're going to have to stand against that. But there, it's hard to get momentum to actually defeat the giant and reclaim the land that's been taken. Sometimes we can be content to just kind of keep the enemy at bay but not actually defeat it. And do you know why? Because giants are big. Giants can seem incredibly overwhelming. And when I'm talking about giants, I'm talking about real giants that people face today. I'm talking about like giants like broken relationships where sinful choices have caused brokenness in relationships. And sometimes you look at that relationship and you know, you know that God would have that relationship to be mended. And you know that God is able to mend that relationship. But when you look at it, you go, no, 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 that giant is too big. I can't conquer that. That's too hard. That's too difficult. So, so we'll just keep things like they are. <laughs> well, we'll just kind of we'll just kind of keep it right here, and we'll we'll just kind of remain in this status quo and not really give up any more ground, but not try to gain ground back. But but let me just ask you a question here. Can we not ask ourselves? Wait a minute, is there a cause? Is there not a cause? When other people look onto that situation and, you, and knowing that you're a child of God, how does that look? How does that look? Is God getting glory out of that? So he says, well, I know, preacher, but you, you don't know how badly I've been hurt. And, and I might not know the depths of hurt there. I just know this, that God's grace is sufficient and that God is able to conquer any kind of hurt and any kind of pain. God is able to get involved in a relationship and bring restoration and bring restitution again. And guess what? He'll do it in such a way that he gets all the glory isn't that a cause for moving forward? Isn't that a cause for forgiving something that you really don't want to forgive? Isn't that a cause for acting like Christ when really your flesh just wants to enjoy its fleshliness for a while? The problem is when we behave according to the flesh, it still brings death. It still brings destruction. And it does nothing to close wounds. It does nothing to mend. It does, it does nothing to, to bring any kind of reconciliation. But I, I look, I know what it is to look at a situation and go, 
that is too big to defeat. That's exactly what the army of Israel did with Goliath. Have you seen him? He's just, he's just too big. David came on and said, I, I don't really care how big he is. I care how big God is. And God's bigger than he is. So let's take him out. And then God gets the glory. And then God is praised. And then thanks is given to God for what he's done. And Israel's reminded that they have a God in Israel who's real and who's powerful and who's, who is able. And I'm telling you, this could do some great things here for the glory of God and for the praise of God. So how about we just look at God and stop looking at the, at the giant? So let me just say to those gathered here this morning, there's, there's a lot of people in here I don't know. But I can tell you this, there are people sitting in this congregation this morning who have faced relationship crises and wondered if it was too big to overcome. It seemed overwhelming. It seemed like we're never going to be able to put this thing back together. It, se it seems like there's no way that my heart could ever trust again. There's no way I could ever not hurt over this. This is just too big. But I'm happy to tell you there are people sitting in this room this morning that have decided that God's name was worthy and the truth was worth standing on. And as much as it hurt and as difficult as it was, they said, we're going to do it God's way. We're going to trust Him. We're going to be obedient. And God's brought restoration again. God's brought functionality to relationships again. God's even given joy and gladness in relationships again. Where people initially looked at a situation and said, I'm, I'm talking about in counseling, said to me, this might be bigger than can ever be overcome. But I'm telling you, with God, it's not. And when you overcome it with God's help, you get the joy of being able to give God the glory because he's real and his way really works. There are people sitting in here that have been in major financial difficulty. And I know what it is to look at a financial mountain that's in front of you and think, this is too big. It's gotten out of hand. It's gotten out of control. I just made some bad decisions, did some things according to the flesh, bought some things I shouldn't buy. Now I'm in the hole. Interest is coming in this and that, and they're going, look, it just, forget it. It's not even worth it. I'm, I'm not going to make any more decisions like that, but the financial burden and the creditors and all of that is just too big of an issue to tackle. I'm just going to either ignore it or look for the easy way out or something like that. But I'm telling you, there's some sitting in this room that have said, this is going to be the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, but with God's help, we're going to tackle this. We're going to make payments. And it's going to take a while. But with God's help, and keeping our focus on Him, and setting our priorities according to His way and not our way, we're going to beat this thing. And I can't tell you the joy in my heart as a pastor to have somebody come in and say, hey, can we talk to you for just a second? Yeah. What's up? Well, remember we were working through this and we kind of sat down and we decided we were just going to face it and set up a plan? Yeah. We made our last payment yesterday. And we're out of it. And we're free. And we're setting some retirement aside now. 
And you go, boy, you couldn't have done that on your own. No, I'm telling you, because with, within, <laughs> within these stories, and I'm not going to tell other people's stories. That'll be up to them to tell. But within these stories are other little stories about how God just made this disappear. And they didn't even have to, they ended up not even having to pay that off. Or all of a sudden, here come this extra bonus from work that wasn't even expected. And now that's a chunk they could just throw on the mountain and knock a big chunk out of the mountain. And I mean, all of a sudden, pieces start falling. And, and here's the thing. People that have been serious about doing it, this is just my experience, but people that have been serious about doing that and trusting the Lord and doing it God's way, I, not only have I known many to conquer that kind of a giant, overwhelming giant, I've never known one who didn't do it ahead of schedule. As if God just said, hey, look, if my name's attached to this, I'm going to show who I really am and what I'm able to do. If I'm going to get the glory out of this, then I can show up in this situation. And he does. I'm, I'm trying to encourage you this morning. I'm trying to say that just like David stood up in, in the midst of a people who said, we can't do that. David said, we have to. Because God's name is at stake. And when we do, and when we are victors, then all who are assembled will know there's a God in Israel. I'm going to tell you this morning, I don't know what your giant is. I don't know what you're facing. It could be some addiction. It could be some sin that you have let go on far too long, and now the hooks are so deep, you think, you know what? It's not even any point in fighting my flesh anymore. Uh, it, it, just, it just has such hold on me. I'm telling you, for God's sake. And I'm not using that as a blasphemy. I'm saying for God's sake. Stand up to that giant. Trust God. Live his way. And when the giant falls, others around you will be able to say, there's a God in his life. There's a God in her life. There's a God working for them in their circumstance because I watched them head out there with that stick and that sling and those smooth rocks and I thought, what are they doing? And I realized what they were doing when they come carrying that head back. I didn't think I'd ever see that. Don't expect everybody around you to be on board either. Uh, go, go read the story of David. Don't, don't expect everybody around you to be on board. Don't, don't expect everybody around you to give you their blessing. Don't expect just massive amounts of courage, encouragement. <laughs> but his name's worth it. His name's worth it. You can face the giant, and with God's help, you can defeat it then don't take the glory for yourself. Don't, don't take the glory for yourself. Just let God get the glory. Because you, you wouldn't have done it without him. You can't do it without him. But with him you can, for his name's sake. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless your word this morning.